Um, thank you everyone for attending D2IQ's webinar focused on the world of cloud native DevSecOps and how to get real value out of running Kubernetes in production and at scale with the Day2IQ Kubernetes platform. Built to deliver day two intelligence, we partner with our customers through their day zero and day one journey by offering CNCF certified training and advisory services, along with our production ready technology and enterprise support for the entire stack as they move into their day two operations. My name is AJ Narula, and I'm the client executive uh, for the public sector at D2IQ focused on the Department of Energy and a few other federal civilian executive agencies. Uh, I'm honored to be joined today by Dan Monell. Dan is a distinguished engineer at D2IQ and understands not only our tech stack, but also as an expert in all things Kubernetes and more. We look for a meaningful discussion today to provide you with some valuable insights into the challenges and adoption of Kubernetes, whether it be with the distribution of a complete upstream stack that is platform, vendor, or cloud agnostic, all the way up to ML AI use cases that research and scientific organizations are demanding from today's technologies. With a customer base um, that spans from some of the largest global names in the financial, auto, and telco industry running to running mission critical projects supporting our national security initiatives with the intelligence community, Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, and even within the DOE, we have provided significant value to our platform teams all across our customer base. I'm happy to answer any questions at the end of this webinar, but for now, let me turn this over to the star of the afternoon, Dan Monell, who can introduce his partner in crime, uh, Beaker, before he, that's Dan, and hopefully not Beaker, <laughs> continues the conversation. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining. Uh, my name's Daniel Monell. I am a distinguished engineer uh, with Day2IQ. I've been with the company for just over four years. I believe my four-year anniversary was a few days ago. Um, the reason I have Beaker Science Manel's picture up here is there is a very good chance you will hear him at some point in time during the session today. So I figured I would go ahead and introduce him up front. Um, like I said, I've been with the company for just about four years. So I've seen the movement in container orchestration and this movement called cloud native uh, that everybody has been hearing about, but quite honestly, a lot of people don't know that much about. But before we get into what we do, I think it's always a good idea to answer the why question. But before we get into that, here are some of the conversation topics we're going to cover today. First off, why are organizations adopting cloud native technologies in Kubernetes? And quite frankly, what is cloud native in Kubernetes? There seems to be some misconception around that within the industry. What are some of the challenges that people run into when attempting to deploy cloud native and Kubernetes applications in production at scale with security? How can we help? How can data A2IQ as an organization help not just with software, but also as AJ said, with advisory services, support and training. Finally, I'd like to talk about a few of our um, success stories uh, that could very well be important to you folks on the phone. I tried to choose three, which would be applicable to the challenges that I believe you're, solve, you're having or that you might encounter with cloud native technologies um, in the future. So as Simon Sinek, Simon Sinek says, start with why. Why are people adopting cloud native and Kubernetes? Well, there's many reasons, but here's a few of the ones that we are running into on a regular basis. Number one, the concept of speed to delivery. People need the ability to iterate applications and software rapidly. This can only be done through a continuous delivery mechanism. And Kubernetes itself, based on the amount of automation and just the containerized manner of Kubernetes, 
fits right into that, as well as many other concepts such as GitOps, Agile, DevSecOps, et cetera. It really has enabled the ability for what some might say mere mortals to do releases on a daily or a multi times per day basis. As we all know, there is more data being generated out in the world today, whether that data is coming from IoT devices like the watch on your wrist or by sensors on machinery that may be running in your environment. All of this data needs to be aggregated, stored, and somehow processed. Kubernetes is the ideal place for that because of its job and long running service concepts. So its ability to scale out as needed, but then scale down as desired. So that workload goes away and the compute resources are made available for other jobs or other workloads. At the core of Kubernetes, and it's actually the reason why Google created Kubernetes is this concept of portability. If I can deploy or I can design my applications to run on Kubernetes, I can run it on any infrastructure that may be on-prem, that may be in cloud A, that may be cloud B, that may mean at the edge somewhere. So the whole of, of idea of build it once and now I can move my application between different environments based on things like cost structures, based on features available on different application stacks. There's a lot of different ways that you can get better results, save money, or move faster. But there's two things that I'm seeing out there a lot in the industry that really brings these three concepts together. Machine learning, and convergence of IT, OT, and integrated logic controllers. We have all this data. I need a way to make sense of it, not only for the past with analytics, but why can't I use it to predict the future or determine what's going to be that next step or that next request that somebody is asking for? We all know the example of the autonomous car, but just something as simple as I'm typing something into a Google search box and it gives me a list of suggestions tailored to my personal search history. All of that is AI based on machine learning. So that's one of the things we're really gonna talk about today. The other thing that we are seeing is this idea of compute moving out of the data center and into the world. That could be autonomous cars with BMW, but it could also be shop floor instances. I've got one customer that is spending a lot of time and investment in deploying Raspberry Pis to many of their manufacturing sites. Currently, I believe they've got over 3,000 Raspberry Pis deployed to some of their manufacturing sites. The problem they have is how do I effectively deploy the software in a rapid, secure manner to these endpoints. Well, Kubernetes is a great way of doing that. So this is what we are seeing in the market today. This is what we're seeing. When we get to the Q&A session, uh, I'd love to hear what you are seeing in the market. In fact, if you'd like to put some things in the uh, chat boxes, um, we'd be more than happy to address them. And in fact, we're gonna have two trivia questions for you. Uh, let's try and keep this a little fun. Um, we will have some swag for you. I don't know what it will be. It might be a t-shirt. It might be a pair of socks. Um, I promise it will be a new t-shirt and a new pair of socks. It won't be out of my drawer. Um, so we've talked about why Kubernetes. Now let's talk about for a moment, what is Kubernetes and this concept of cloud native? Because there's a lot of misconceptions in the world. Let's start with cloud native. Cloud native is a set of technologies, but it's more of a mindset focused on deploying and managing scalable applications. Those applications can be running on public, private, or hybrid cloud environments. And this is one of the big misconceptions I think people have is 
you say cloud native and people think, oh, I've got to be running it in one of the public clouds, Google, Amazon, Azure, what have you. Nothing could be further from the case. You can run cloud native on your infrastructure in your data center. We're helping the Navy right now with some of their cloud native concepts for putting it on nuclear submarines so they can go cloud native and machine learning at the bottom of the ocean if necessary. The whole idea behind it is things should be resilient as in recover from fault, manageable where I can make changes to my running environment and observable. I should have an open way of understanding what's going on within my infrastructure and my applications and where are my bottlenecks. The whole idea behind this is to enable frequent changes to our software stack so that I can deploy something. And once I wanna make improvements to it, I can deploy it again with minimal risk to my end users or minimal work needed to update that. Those of us who have been around for a long time know the problem of, well, we've got a window to change things out. And if the stars don't align, then we're gonna miss that window. The whole idea behind microservices and cloud native is because everything is loosely coupled, I should be able to update individual components independent of each other. So this is the concept of cloud native. So what is Kubernetes? Is it the greatest thing since sliced bread? Is it a unicorn? Well, at the end of the day, Kubernetes is an open source container orchestration platform for automating application deployment. Think of it as the conductor standing in front of an orchestra. Kubernetes itself does not play the instruments. It directs the musicians. It was originally designed by Google uh, to provide a platform for um, automating deployment scaling. The little known secret is in reality, Kubernetes was designed and built as a way of stealing workload from AWS. They finally came up with, they finally were willing to admit it in public. And there's a uh, good recording on YouTube of one of the guys saying, yeah, what we really wanted to do was to provide portability of workloads so that we could steal workload from AWS and put it on GCP. So who manages all these things? Well, the governing body for cloud native is the cloud native compute foundation or the cloud native computing foundation CNCF. The CNCF is an offshoot or a subset of the Linux foundation that focuses on curating and managing projects through the incubation sandbox and um, graduation phase. Kubernetes is one of them. These are just a list of the other uh, projects that have been graduated to graduated stage. When you look at the CNCF landscape, there are hundreds of projects. There are many different vendors. And this is where the problem comes in. But I don't want to talk about problems yet. But I think you can take a look at this and it can be overwhelming at times when you think I've got Kubernetes. Well, Kubernetes isn't just Kubernetes. So what are some of the challenges people run into on a regular basis? Well, let's take a walk back in time a little bit. A few years ago, this concept of containerization in IT came about. It was really more than a few years ago. It's been around for a long time in Solaris uh, zones and IBM LPARs, but it really picked up about, eh, about nine years ago, let's say. And people started containerizing their applications in Docker. And they said, wow, this is great. I can package all my dependencies up, put them in this container or put it in an image and then deploy that image as a container and everything goes with it. Great for development. Well, well, 
Then came this idea of why can't I do that at scale? So Docker Swarm, Kubernetes, and Mesos DCOS, our previous product, um, were some of the early um, enterprise grade implementations of container orchestration. But problems arise when you start to do things at scale. How do I manage multiple containers? How do I maintain my networking uh, connections between things and provide security so that those people who should be able to access workloads can and those who cannot or should not cannot how do i ensure that i let the right people in while keeping the wrong people out we've seen a lot of this um, recently um, with cyber attacks coming from different parts of the world against different parts of the world so the ability to secure this is of critical importance especially when you get into this concept of industrial IoT. Um, I just recently finished an interesting book called Sandworm, which talks about the Russian attacks on the Ukraine. And yes, it is possible to physically destroy machinery with a few lines of code. Good book if anybody uh, has not read it um, or has read it, great book. So we've gone from a single container now we went to multiple containers running in production. Then the question becomes, once this starts to grow even further, and I've got multiple clusters that are all gonna need to talk to each other, how do I bring some form of method to this madness? How do I create the ability to stamp out, whether you wanna call it templates or t-shirt sizes of not only the applications, but the complete environment so that my development environment looks just like my test and QA, as well as my production environment. Java was supposedly the build at once run anywhere methodology capability. Containers said, well, it solves the it works on my machine problems. But in reality, we're running into the problem nowadays of, well, it works on my cluster. I don't know why it doesn't run on your cluster. So these are all challenges around how do I create uniform environments that adhere to my DevSecOps principles, whether that's zero trust or what have you, so that I can securely deploy my applications at scale. Other challenges that we're seeing are things like, how do I get started with Kubernetes and containerization? Um, I've got a massive old application that I just don't know where to get started. We talked a little bit about cluster sprawl and just the growth. Anytime there's a new technology that comes to market, it has a tendency to grow organically until it, be, until it becomes unwieldy. And then what happens after that is you have an overcorrection where IT organizations lock things down too hard. And you have this back and forth between the people who need the resources and the people who control the resources. When Kubernetes was first created, it was created for stateless applications. And by that, we mean a pod or a container comes up, it runs, if it dies, I don't care because there's no data in it. There's nothing associated with that pod that cannot be recreated. Well, in today's world, that's no longer the case. People are building massive data services, NoSQL database, um, Kafka streaming buses, many other things are being used that require some form of data or state associated with them. How do I handle that in a complex world? Security, as we talked about earlier, is of the forefront of people's minds. How do I let the right people in while let it, keeping the wrong people out? And at the same time, manage the capacity that I am giving to these individual people. So how do I ensure that my developers have access to enough resources to do their job, but they don't run into this problem of a noisy 
or nosy neighbor. Noisy neighbors are the ones where people will just deploy all sorts of workloads and never tear them down. Well, if those workloads are deployed, nobody else has the ability to use those resources. And nosy neighbors are ones where I want one workload to not be able to see what the other one is doing. This is solved by multi-tenancy. Machine learning is great for um, Kubernetes. In fact, we're gonna spend a good amount of time to talking today about machine learning and the challenges that it brings because it itself is another layer of complex ability or of complexity on top of Kubernetes. Operational visibility is typically an afterthought for a lot of organizations, but it's critical to understanding how are my applications running and how are my, how is my infrastructure supporting that? Where do I need to add capacity? Where do I need to remove capacity? So that I can effectively manage the life cycle of my applications and ensure that the right amount of capacity is being given to the proper application or one of my favorite analogies, I need to make sure I'm putting the wood behind the right arrow. So these are the challenges we're running into within the industry. Quite honestly, most of these are the challenges you run into anytime you provide a new type of technology or a new way of doing things. These are all growing pains. We had them when we moved to mini computers. We had them when we moved to client server, virtualization, and now containerization. We at Day2IQ really do something pretty simple. We enable digital transformation. So we help you adopt these new technologies by simplifying and automating the deployment, management, and securing of Kubernetes as a core capability, but also those associated cloud native technologies that are required to run containerized workloads on, on Kubernetes in production at scale. And those are the, really the two key things that I want you to think about. In production at scale. Technology adoption typically follows the sandbox methodology where people will start using things and then it gets into production and then we run into production issues, whether it's security, scalability, what have you. And you see the clamp down coming and we start to see people locking down access to these technologies. Little bit of our track record. We got our start in 2013, helping companies like Twitter and Airbnb overcome their scaling challenges. We did this initially when our company's name was Mesosphere and the product was DCOS, the data center operating system. Those of you who have been in containerization for a while might be familiar with the Mesos project. During that time, we've gotten a lot of insight and investment from numerous organizations, one of which is the US federal government through the InQtel program uh, through the intelligence community. Also during that time, we've alloc or we've gathered a large set of what some would call blue chip customers that have helped us learn how to make organizations successful with containers, and cloud native technologies. Within the federal space, Argonne National Labs is one of them, the Department of Homeland Security, the US Navy, the Air Force, as well as other three letter agencies, which shall not be named, let's just say that. But as I said earlier, our focus has always been around enterprise grade production at scale with support for data services. Why is that important? That's important because data is what any organization runs on. If I'm not somehow processing data, taking an input, processing it, and making an output for something else, you're really not doing anything but playing Candy Crush. Data is at the heart 
of any organization, whether you are scientific, financial, retail, military, what have you. And we do this with an open platform of upstream technologies, providing training, services, support, and upstream open source technologies. In fact, we are one of the only companies in the US that has a Kubernetes certified distribution, is a certified training partner and solution partner. So no matter where you are on your journey, I'm pretty confident we can help you. So let's go back to this map that we talked about. Just take a look at this. If I were to deploy a cloud native compute found or a CNCF platform based on Kubernetes, there are many decisions I have to make just to get Kubernetes up and running. I've got to select a container runtime. I've got to select a monitoring stack, logging stack, um, directory integration for security, storage, DNS, network overlay, the list goes on and on. Find a training partner, find somebody to help me get it deployed and create my best practices. This has been why many Kubernetes distributions or Kubernetes um, projects have run into problems because it's more than just Kubernetes. At day two IQ, we approach this problem from many different directions. At the basis of what we do, we provide expert services and training to help you build that center of excellence within your organization. And when it's time to deploy, we have an upstream Kubernetes distribution ready to go. This is the basis of what we call enterprise grade. With our defaults, typically, we are comfortable taking our distribution to production for most of our organizations. We didn't start with a lab base. We started with production in mind. Why? Because you should begin with the end in mind. On top of that, we have different workloads that different people might choose to find interesting. So Kafka, Cassandra, and Spark. This is our heritage from our DCOS days. And this is these are three of the big workloads that people have asked us to run. Captain is our machine learning platform. This is becoming incredibly valuable to a lot of organizations because as you're processing or using all that data to learn, it requires that you go through a complicated cycle of building, deploying, training, tuning, and publishing. We automate that whole thing for you within our machine learning pipeline. And finally, Commander provides a top-down view of the clustered environment or multiple clustered environments, providing you multi-tenancy, multi-cluster, and multi-cloud management. Or another way to look at it is we provide governance and observability across your entire cloud native stack. The beautiful thing about this is whether I'm putting it in the cloud I'm putting it in the data center, or I'm putting it in the edge, or, or I'm putting it in a hole in the ground, the deployment and operating process is going to be nearly identical because it is a common distribution that can be deployed across any and all compute environments, cloud, data center, edge, what have you. And we provide full 24-7 365 support for all of the components that we put together. So when you look at that map and you think, oh shoot, I'm gonna have to go get a support contract for my storage, for my container runtime, for my service mesh, for my service discovery, for logging, et cetera, et cetera. We take that on. We provide code level support because we have the people 
that are on the boards of these different open source projects to act as your proxy or to act as your advocate within the open source community. So if there are things that you need deployed, we're here to help, not only from a technology perspective, but also from a training and services perspective. Here's another way to look at uh, what we were just talking about from the different components. When you think about what does it take to put together a Kubernetes distribution for your organization, there's the core piece, Kubernetes, but then there's the other components that I need, like networking and ingress, traffic and core DNS, directory integration with DEX, logging with an EFK stack, monitoring with a Prometheus and Grafana stack. All of this is provided for you as part of a single command convoy up deployment. Once I have my base infrastructure in place, now I can start working with the things in the second ring. So who are the other people that are in the market today that I may need help with other things? Well, cloud providers, API gateways, service meshes, other storage providers. We work directly with most of these organizations in order to ensure that no matter what your workload looks like, it will run on our Kubernetes. Because at the end of the day, our Kubernetes is upstream Kubernetes. We pull packages directly from the open source communities. Okay, first trivia question. I'm paraphrasing here a little bit. For 30 years, they questioned the need for Kubernetes. Today, we're gonna give them the answer. Who can tell me what movie this quote is from? If you can, please put it in the uh, chat window. Whoever gets it in first, we will find something in our um, giveaway box and send it to you. This is machine learning. Machine learning has been a challenge for the past few years and has yet to really pay off as far as the benefits that have been promised. Why? Well, let's look at what makes it a money pit. Over $50 billion were spent on it in 2020. 87% of initiatives never make it to production. They never make their way to being a finalized model that has been deployed in production, taking API calls. In fact, 55% of the organizations out there have never deployed a single model into production that are trying to. Why? Well, in many, time, in many situations, it can play, take up to 90 days. Think about that for a second. I've got a ML model that needs to be deployed. It can take up to 90 days to deploy that, just deploy. So by the time it makes it into production, you may need to retrain that model. So when you look at it, what is it? It's a race against the clock. I have to build my model. I have to train my model, tune my model. And then finally, once I figure out what the right version is, I need to deploy it into production. Most organizations fail at this because by the time they get it out, it's out of date. Why? Well, machine learning is still a novel concept. Um, even those companies like Facebook and Google and Twitter have only really been doing it for the last five years. And these are those unicorn companies that can quote unquote, go get the smartest and best people in the market. It's complex. We looked at the complexity of the Kubernetes landscape. The machine learning and AI landscape is just as complicated. So it's not complicated times two, it's complicated squared. Like CICD of, of we'll just say 10 years ago, 
um, machine learning has a problem with attempting to stitch together um, a pipeline. As such, only 5% of the code that we're seeing out there is actually machine learning code. The rest is scaffolding that is put in place to get from the beginning to the end. And finally, anytime you try and stitch something together manually, there is a concern with the data or the security of that data, whether it be user access, leakage, breach, what have you. The main problem is that machine learning requires skill sets of both DevOps and data science. And quite honestly, those people are few and far between. And the people that can do both are really expensive. So when you wanna look at a use case, let's take a look at a machine learning use case. I want to tune the hyperparameters of a model by running four experiments in parallel with each experiment running on two nodes. Well, the first thing you got to do is write the code in a notebook. Then you've got to context switch, build the Docker outside of the notebook. So I've got another technology set that I've got to learn. I've got to define the YAML spec for tuning that or for deploying that Docker image, context switch skill set. I've got to deploy it. Say it with me. Skill set, context switch. I've got to monitor what's going on within my processing or jobs. I've got to look at it and understand which is the best outcome based on the ones that I've based on what was set as my parameters. I've got to push it to a registry and finally push it off to some form of a production environment. Each one of these things is an individual stovepipe, which requires different teams, different skill sets, and typically requires weight between the different steps. Day two IQ captain is an enterprise cube flow distribution for ML ops that runs on top of our Kubernetes distribution. So you get the benefits of dynamic resource allocation, the benefits of role-based access control, the benefits of namespace isolation between workloads so that you can have a secure scalable machine learning platform instead of having many, many workstations on people's desks, at any given time, anyone has access to the resources of the cluster on which they are working. And when we start talking about using GPUs or a graphic process, graphical processing units from companies like NVIDIA, the costs associated with providing everybody their own isolated environment goes through the roof if you can even get them, if you can even find them. So it allows a shared compute model and it allows you to use the dynamic allocation of, of CPU, memory, networking that Kubernetes provides to allow you to iterate more quickly. So now back to that use case, I wanna tune the hyperparameters of a model, et cetera, et cetera. Well, this truly becomes a few lines of configuration and a few methods that the data scientist will then put into their Jupyter notebook. Model.train, model.tune, model.deploy. How many workers? What type of parallel am I looking for? What are the hyperparameters that I want to use? How many epics do I want to run? All of these things, once you give it the recipe card, as you see here, automation takes care of the rest. As we like to say, prototype to production, what used to take months now can take days 
possibly even hours. So you go from a situation like this, where you're dealing with the stovepiped world, giving p things between groups to de develop, train, tune, to a faster automated workflow that allows you a successful deployment of your machine learning models, because instead of dealing with manual processes, you are dealing with an automated pipeline so that the data scientist truly can send, hit a train, tune, deploy, and then deploy into production, all with a hot swap capability so that the end users never see any downtime or degradation of service. So where have we seen, or where have we been able to help some of our customers? This is, uh, this is where the true rubber hits the road, if you will. The first one I want to talk about is CSIRO uh, out of Australia, because they're an organization, in my mind, um, very similar to what the DOE and um, Argonne is dealing with. They are are the uh, scientific research arm of the Australian federal government. Some of you may even work have worked with them in the past. Um, they were dealing with a problem of having a large compute farm that was just sitting there idle. They had made a massive investment in compute, including CPU and GPU. And they were just seeing that this compute farm was going to waste. Well, they were able to deploy Convoy and Captain, the Kubernetes plus Kubeflow distribution. And what does that mean? Well, instead of it taking seven days for data scientists to get their services out the door, it went to seven minutes. Think about that for a second. Seven days to seven minutes delivering open source services, microservices, not machine learning, but those things that are just standard op application microservices went from three months down to three hours. In effect, they were able to save over $2 million per year in infrastructure costs. This project more than paid for itself multiple times over. But the thing that I like best is from a personnel perspective. Prior to implementing Captain and its notebook first approach, it was taking them a week to onboard a new data scientist to give them everything that they needed to get going and get them doing their job. We got that down to under a day so that those people that were coming on board were productive nearly immediately and could contribute to the organizational outcome. The one we talk about a lot of the times is the United States Air Force and Platform One, part of the uh, Department of Defense DevSecOps um, group. Why was this important? They needed a way to deploy rapidly consistent Kubernetes in highly complex, highly secure environments. Uh, we're talking IL-2 through IL-6 plus um, environments. If you're familiar with those, or if you're not familiar with those, those are increasing levels of uh, basically security or impact levels that more and more and more close down access to data. And being a DOE organization, I could imagine that you have things similar we were able to cut their deployment of new environments by 96% because of the automation and simplification that we provide in deploying to their environment. I personally was on a session where we accomplished in 12 hours what other people in the organ in the with one person actually two sorry two people. We accomplished in 12 hours with two people what other organizations could not accomplish in six months and a team of five. 
Why? Because of the way we built our automation to be not only complete, but flexible enough to weave the requirements of things like AWS GovCloud. If you've ever tried to deploy to AWS GovCloud, it is not the same as trying just to deploy to AWS. So this is where we were able to help them consistently deploy environments with FIP security, with a best of breed open source tool stack ready to go. And finally, my final um, example comes from one of my personal customers out of the uh, Philadelphia area, Ecuvia, formerly known as Quintiles IMS. You may have heard of them. Um, they are a data processor for the pharmaceuticals industry. So you can imagine that they run massive amounts of data analytics on an ongoing basis on the data that they provide or get from pharmacies and pharmaceutical uh, companies as they're running their trials and experiments. Couple things we were able to help them do. Number one, we were able to help them maintain an incredible uptime of five nines, 99.999% uptime with only two people on staff managing their Kubernetes environments. Why? Because everything was templated. There's this concept of infrastructure as code that everybody is talking about, where if I can create software that defines how my infrastructure is going to be laid out, it just becomes a repeatable process. That's the first thing. But the other thing we were able to do is we were able to help them shrink their Spark analytics jobs from 20 hours to 2.5 hours with our kudo operators for Spark. Our operators are open source, by the way. They're free to use if you want. Kudo.dev if you want to take a look. We've got a few other out there. The main ones we as an organization focus on are Kafka, Spark, and Cassandra. 88% reduction in time to run a job. How quickly could you iterate if a job that used to take overnight could be done while you were at lunch? These are just a few of the examples of people that we have helped, not just because we have great software, but because we have great people and because we have the knowledge and experience, we've been doing this since 2013. We've been there, we've done that, we've got all the t-shirts. So really, if I were to boil it down, what separates us from other companies out there? We focus on making the hard things easy, using upstream open source best of breed technology. We do this with the lowest total cost of ownership with independence in mind. So this is not an example of where you are going to be locked into a large vendor contract and there's no getting out of it. Use us or don't, but you can actually make that decision without having to realize that I'm getting into a forever um, decision. It is based on upstream open source Kubernetes. This means that we can provide you the most secure, most up-to-date platform without having to worry about critical vulnerabilities based on the fact that we've forked our platform. In fact, we not only run critical vulnerability scanning for each and every release, we publish what vulnerabilities we found critical, major, minor, and we make it available. We are one of the founding members of the CNCF. So we have people in, the pl in place to help with these things. We have the expertise to help you as an organization, no matter what you are looking to do, whether it's 
Raspberry Pis on the edge, data storage and streaming and analytics in the data center, continuous delivery via GitOps, or you're looking to build out software factories like many public sector organizations that I've talked to are looking to do. We have the expertise, not only within our technology, but in our people, and we can help get you there as well. Thank you everybody for taking the time today.